Well, I got something different. I did, and I shared my testimony with the youth. I kind of want to tie my testimony into a sermon called Watch Your Mouth. So everybody look at your neighbor, look across the room, and just yell, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. <laughs> look at somebody else and say, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Now say it with a little bit of pep, you know, say, watch your mouth. <laughs> All right. Is everybody awake? Does everybody in here, does anyone in here, I should say, know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is? You know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is? So if you don't know, and I don't know, I watched a biography on Netflix with my wife about Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so Arnold Schwarzenegger was this bodybuilder. He was obviously a politician. He was obviously an actor. But for those of you that don't know him, for, especially for the kids in here, you guys might not know Arnold Schwarzenegger. But anyways, I got this sermon from watching this Netflix series. So in this Netflix series, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's growing up in Austria, so it paints the picture of his childhood. And so in his childhood, uh, this is where I got, it's, so I'm talking about watch your mouth. So I'm talking about our confession. And so I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger confessing. I saw him believing. I saw him speaking out. And so he, he went on to uh, go from Austria to America. But as he was, you know, confessing, and, and so let me slow it down because I'm trying to get too ahead of myself. So he obviously, he went on to be a politician. He was uh, Mr. Universe. Uh, Mr. Olympia, so and then he was a uh, the governor of California. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, by the world standards, was a very is still alive, obviously, but he's a very accomplished man, right? And so, as he was a child, in his room he had a picture or a poster of a of a bodybuilder of Mr. Olympia, and so he would actually take his face and put his face on that poster. And so he was envisioning himself as Mr. Universe from an early age. And so why am I saying all that? Because we see Mr. Schwarzenegger, Mr. Arnold Schwarzenegger, speaking life. We see him, you know, confessing. He's believing. He's saying, I'm going to do this. No matter what anybody says about me, no matter what anybody thinks about me, and people call them crazy. They're like, you're crazy, dude. You're not going to go to America and be a bodybuilder? Like, what are you thinking? Like, he's just some scrawny kid, and he's telling everybody, no, I'm going to do it. And so as believers, that's how we're to speak. And so it really motivated me. I don't even know if Arnold Schwarzenegger was saved. I don't know if he is saved, but he sure talked like a believer. Amen? So I saw him speak like a believer. And so this really inspired me to get back to reminding us about our words. So let's go to the word Proverbs 18, 21 in the New King James Version. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So this says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So this is not going to be probably a dancing and shouting sermon, but this sermon, I believe uh, so many times in the word and faith or you know, some people call the name it and claim it or the blab it and grab it. You know, you've heard the words that people will call the word of faith, but it's absolutely real. You know, it's ab- it will absolutely change your life. And so I want to I remind us about the power of our words this morning. And so it says, death and life are in the power of our tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. But so many times as Christians, we just believe that what we say does not matter. We believe that speaking is for communicating what we see, what we think, and what we feel. And sometimes we think that just what we're saying, you know, when you speak it out, it just goes there and doesn't keep going. Well, that's not the case. Our words are a spiritual thing just as much as they are a natural thing. So, you know, what we're saying takes effect in the, in the natural, obviously, which we live in the natural, but there's also a spiritual realm. So what we're saying matters, and what we're saying affects not only the natural realm, but the spiritual realm. 
And so let me take you to James 3. So if you have your Bibles, James 3, 3. And this is in the NIV. It says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so, so, so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So we see here, you could say, we see that there's a rudder. If you've ever been on, have, has anybody ever been on a cruise ship or been on a boat? So you see on a cruise ship, this massive ship, and then you see this rudder, this very small rudder. And the rudder is what steers the boat. So, and then we go on to see, said, they're steered by a very small rudder. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. So we could compare that to the rudder, right? That rudder on that cruise ship. So it says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets a world of evil among the... It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. So get this. This is important right here. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings. Who have been made in his image, in his likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. So we can see here, we could compare the tongue to the rudder on the ship or the tongue to the bit in the horse's mouth. And we could say that the tongue is a steering wheel for our life because what we say there has the power of life and the power of death. And so what do I mean by that? So let's go to, uh, let's, let's talk about this blessing. So what is blessing? Well, blessing is building up. Words of life, words of encouragement, words of accomplishment, speaking out his word, his promises, what his word says about you. So what this Bible says about you, who he says you are in Christ, what he says you have in Christ is speaking out blessing. That's speaking out life. That's words of life. And then, of course, words of building up, you know, encouraging people, building others up. That's speaking out life. And so what is cursing? And we're not really talking, I don't want to focus on like cussing somebody, which that absolutely falls in line with cursing somebody. But I'm talking about death words. So we're, we're gonna, we'll call them death words and we'll say life words because Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So we'll talk about death words or cursing. So cursing is, de- is words of death, words of fear, words of worry, words of doubt, words of unbelief. And so the enemy is so uh, crafty, and he's so, he's, he's the god of lies. He's the deceiver. And so the way he works is he makes you think that what you're saying does not matter. And so here's a great example. So say you get out of bed in the morning, you wake up and you say, oh man, I don't feel good. Man, I feel like I'm going to die. Man, I never, my stomach always hurts in the morning. I never feel good. Well, unfortunately, that's speaking death. And it's so simple to not realize that those words take effect. It's so simple to just think that you're just saying it. And we're never just saying it. So I missed the first point to give you. Uh, Let me go back and slow down. So point number one, we are to speak blessing, not cursing, okay? So we're on a point number two. It says, God needs us to say it. So Romans 10, let's go to Romans 10 and 9 through 10. So it says that if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so 
this is what I, you know, you see, you confess with your mouth. So if we don't believe that our words have power, we don't believe that our words take effect, and we, go, we can go back to Genesis. We see that God spoke. He said, let there be light. And so how did he create things? He spoke. He, he spoke for effect. He spoke to create and change things. And so we're made in his image, his likeness, so we're to speak for effect. We're to speak to create and change things. Amen? So I want everybody to just repeat after me. I'm choosing to speak life. I'm choosing to speak blessing, and I'm not going to speak cursing. I'm not going to speak words of death. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. And like I said, God uses his words to create and change things. In the same way, we're to use our words to create and change things, because there is power behind our words. What we say absolutely matters. And I just, I'm here to remind you this morning that what we say matters. And I've seen this work in my life. I've seen this happen in my life. So I want to talk about my time in prison now. So my time in prison obviously was not easy. You know, prison is not an easy place. But I watch this word. This word changed my life, completely changed my life. And I just started confessing it. I started believing God for favor with the judge, favor with the district attorney, favor with anybody who had anything to do with my case. And I confessed it, and I believed it, and it happened. I watched it work in my life, and I've seen it work since I've been home. I've, obviously, you go through things, and I've seen it happen. I've seen it take control of my life. I've seen my life with me speaking out words of death, and I see where that has taken me. But I've also seen the same way of my life speaking out life, speaking out his word, and I've seen where that's taken me. So I want to encourage you this morning, if, if maybe you've been speaking out words of death and you just didn't realize it, maybe you just were reminded this morning that, you know, you're only going to speak out life. And so if you want to make that commitment this morning to come down here and speak out, you know, you want to change your life, you want to change the way you talk, you want to change everything about you, then I want to give you that opportunity this morning. But I'm sorry, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Let me go to point number three. Point number three is we speak for effect. And so like I said, I saw that take control. I saw that work in my life. I saw God work in my life by what I was saying. And so if it can work in my life, you know, being in prison, being a drug addict, being, you know, going through basically hell. I mean, I've, I've had to go through a lot of situations from a young age, but I saw it work in my life, and I've see, I see it work in my life. Like I said, I, I've seen myself speak words of death, and I saw where that took me, and I've seen myself speak words of life, and I saw where that took me. So I'll start out with my childhood, just to paint the picture of, you know, how I grew up. So um, from an early age, you know, I always dealt with anger. I always was that angry kid that, and there was no reason for it. You know, I grew up in a good home. I had a great family. I was taught right. Um, but, you know, I struggled with anger. And around eight years old, my parents were divorced. And so that kind of had a little impact on my life. And around 11 to 12 years old, I got involved in drugs at an early age. It started out with marijuana, alcohol, and it progressed, and I became a full-fledged drug addict at 16 years old. And so that was where I was at, you know, full-fledged drug addict, selling drugs, you know. But I had this legacy. You know, I grew up in church my entire life. I knew the word, but I ran from it. And so some of us... Have, who's all grown up in church their entire life in here? So you can probably relate. There was a lot of tradition. There was a lot of, it was just, there was no relationship. And so I didn't have a personal relationship with God. I did not have, I didn't read my Bible. I didn't know God. I didn't know him personally. And so I got to, see, I got to, to this place where I was riding off my family's relationship and so I didn't have that personal relationship. And so 
obviously, if you're not living for God, there's an, you know, an emptiness. And I just always had this emptiness, and I, I never knew. I always tried to fill it with something. But really, it was just because I didn't have God in my life. And so, flash forward to 18, you know, I'm selling drugs, full-fledged drug addict, and 18 years old comes around, and uh, there, I, w- I wanted out. I needed a way out. And so, my way out, I thought, was going to be going to the Marines. So, there was a guy there that enlisted, who was enlisted in the Marines, and so, he saw that, you know, I was messing up, and He's like, hey, man, I think it would be a, a good idea if you enlisted. And so I'm like, yeah, this, this might be my way out. So this, I, this was that hope. This was like that way that I could escape, get away from the drugs, get away from the people, get away from partying, get away from that lifestyle because I was so empty. I had nothing. I had no hope. I had no future. I was depressed. I was carrying anxiety around all the time. I couldn't even talk to people. I mean, I was bad. I was in bad shape. And so, 18, you know, I'm actually enlisted in the Marines at this, at this point. And, uh, you know, I had some structure. I'm going back and forth to PT. Um, but what happened, you know, obviously going, I had eight months. So there was a thing called the Deployed Entry Program. So the Deployed Entry Program means that you have like a period of time before you go to boot camp. And so there was an eight-month period uh, where I'm, still selling drugs, doing everything I was doing, but I had some sort of structure. So there was the structure of having that hope to know like, hey, I can go to the military and I can get away from this. Well, that's not how it worked out. So I actually ended up failing a drug test. I was supposed to go to boot camp. The, the dates didn't work out. Uh, I actually was told the wrong date by my recruiter. And so... Um, After being told the wrong date, and then he told me another date, and I thought I had time to, you know, go do my thing, because I had gotten clean to go to boot camp. So I went out, did my same thing, but then he calls, and he's like, hey, you're going uh, actually this week. And so I had to call him and tell him, like, I'm not going to pass a drug test. And so at that point, he told me, you're not going to be Marine. So when he said, you're not going to be Marine, that was the first breaking point. So that was where things just fell apart. 18 years old, uh, you know, about to turn 19. um, And it just looked like no hope. It just looked like I was never going to make it out. And so shortly after that, uh, I I was selling drugs with two younger guys. The younger guys got robbed. We were at a party. It was spring break 2017. Uh, The younger guys got robbed. And so us being full-fledged drug addicts, drunk, high, you name it, we decided to go back to this guy's house, the guy who robbed us, because we found out who it was, and shoot his house up. So that's where it took me. I, we literally did a drive-by shooting. And so, I mean, you guys are looking, I mean, I know it's crazy. I know it's crazy, but we did a drive-by shooting. And so that's where that lifestyle takes you. That's where that lifestyle of drugging, partying will take you. And you're saying, how in the world did this kid end up in this spot? Well, it's because the enemy is real. There is a real devil. Just, just as God is real, there's absolutely a devil. And his purpose is to steal, his purpose is to kill, and his purpose is to destroy. And so I saw him do all three of those things in my life. And so that's why what we say matters. Because if you're speaking out the words of the enemy, which are words of death, you're giving him access into your life. But in the same way, when you're speaking out words of life, you're giving God access in your life. But back to, so we're just did a drive-by shooting. And, and, you know, even looking back on it now, I'm like, how in the world did I get to that place? I was taught right. I was raised right. I didn't have the excuse of saying, oh, well, my family was you know, we were poor and we didn't, I never had anything. I lived on the streets and that's not an excuse, but I did not have that excuse. I had everything I needed. I had a good family. I was taught right. I grew up in church, but like I said, the devil's purpose is to steal, 
His purpose is to kill, and his purpose is to destroy. And so I saw that, and I was living for him. I gave him access by my lifestyle. And so we can give the devil access by our lifestyle, by our words. And so uh, I'm hopeless. Obviously, I said point number one, not being a Marine, was my breaking point. But point number two was going to prison. That was my real breaking point. Like You think that was a breaking point, them telling you, them telling me I was not going to be a Marine. Point number two, that was it. I thought I was done. I thought it was over. The enemy told me, you know, he's constantly in my mind telling me, you're never going to make it out of this. You're never going to be anything. You're never going to, and I'm sure some of you guys have heard that before. And it's just a lie. It's an absolute lie. And so I'm in, at this point, I've been arrested, um, you know, never been arrested before in my life. I'm scared to death. I wanted to give up. I wanted to just, honestly, I wanted to die. I did not want to be alive. But I got a hold of this word. I got a hold of this truth. I got a hold, this changed my life. This absolutely changed my life. And, and there's a place called Adult and Teen Challenge. Has anybody ever heard of Adult and Teen Challenge? So Adult and Teen Challenge is a faith-based recovery program. It's a 12-month recovery program. And that's where I found the Lord. That's where I got a hold of this word. That's where I built the foundation, which I had a foundation. I knew the word, but I didn't live it. I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's so important, even as kids, you know, you can go for so long. But like I said, I wrote off my family's relationship. I wrote off their relationship with God. And it was not my relationship. So it's important for us to have a personal relationship. So I'm in Teen Challenge now, uh, Adult and Teen Challenge. I'm going back and forth to court. Um, I had a, so I'm trying to get sentenced to this program. That's what, I, that's what we were trying to do. I was trying to get sentenced to this program, trying to stay out of prison. Um, and so this program is a very structured program. It's a very disciplined program. It's basically like being in jail, but you're being taught the Bible and you're working and you're not getting paid, but so this program was hard. It was a hard, I was, got, I had got bonded out of jail. So after being in jail, Tulsa County Jail for three weeks, I was bonded out and ended up in this program. And so this was a voluntary thing. I was not sentenced to this program. I decided, I, I knew I needed to change. I was hopeless. I had no hope. And like I said, I just wanted to die. And so this was that second chance. This was that chance of hope. And so I decided that it was best for me to go to this program. And so my parents, you know, took me out to this program. And at first it was hard. I'll admit to you, I, you know, obviously I wanted to change, but I've been living for the enemy for so long that my conscience was seared. And so, you know, I didn't feel remorse for what I had done before. And I did not, you know, because, you know, when you're living for him, he, he starts to sear your conscience. So you start to make compromise after compromise, after compromise. And what happens is that, you know, you start to not feel remorse, you know, because, you know, we have that conviction. We know whenever what we're doing is wrong. But as you're living for the enemy, you stop to have that conviction. And so that was the place I was in. But the Lord got a hold of my heart. Uh, four months into the program, there was a camp, and it was a HEB camp. It was, so this was like fun. Going to a camp, going to hear speakers at Teen Challenge, this was amazing. And so I'm like, man, this is great. And the speakers are coming in, and they say, uh, you know, they're talking about water baptism. And I'm like, I've never been baptized. Like, I grew up in church my entire life, but I've never been baptized. And so, um, you know, there was the Frio River there at this camp, and the Frio River is where I got baptized. And when I went under that water, I became a new man, a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, the old has passed, the new has come. You know, I became that, that new creation spiritually, and I saw it work in my life. I, the way I thought, everything about the depression, the feeling of not wanting to live anymore, the feeling of wanting to be a drug addict for the rest of my life, completely got taken away. And so that was, that was the first time in my life where I 
really just felt the presence of God for like a genuine, tangible experience. And I had it and it changed my life.